Welcome to Her Story, the history of Southeast Asia told from her perspective. We'll discover historical figures, matriarchal societies, and contemporary female icons, and maybe learn about ourselves along the way. I'm your host, Agas Ramirez. In this episode, we're going to talk about the many lives of Emiria Sunasa, a pioneer of Indonesian modern art who was also a nurse, singer, pianist, traveler, and political activist who claimed to be a princess of the Tidore Sultanate. According to art historian Dr. Wulan Dirgantoro, Emiria Sunasa was one of the few women painters active during the early years of Indonesian modern art. That much is clear and verifiable. The rest of her life, however, is more of a mystery. Emiria Sunasa was born on August 5, 1894 in eastern Indonesia. The first theory is that she was born in Tidore, in the Maluku Islands, presently in North Maluku, Indonesia. Well, not just born there, she claimed to be the daughter of the then Sultan of Tidore, Sultan Sahajuan, who ruled around 1893. If she was born in 1894, the date does check out. Her full name, as recorded later, was Emiria Sunasa Wamana Putri Al-Alam Makota Tidore. But she went by another name, which supports a different theory of her origins. The second theory, which seems to be more widely accepted, is that she was not born in Tidore, but in Tanawanko. This is a small village inhabited by a Tidorese community in North Sulawesi, southwest of the province's capital of Manado. Some people remembered her as coming from a Manopo Pereira family from Manado. She was also known as Emma Wilhelmina Pereira or Emmy Pereira. Either way, it's possible that she had both Manado and Tidore heritage because of her political involvement so later in life that indicated a strong commitment to Eastern Indonesia and Maluku in the Sulawesi communities. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. Emiria was educated under the Dutch system. She attended the Europish Laher school, but only until the third grade. Still, the fact that she went to the European elementary school suggests that her family had some rank and influence within the colonial administration of the time. These Dutch schools were exclusively for the children of Dutch and foreign officials and residents. The subjects taught that the basic education level included reading, writing, numeracy, Dutch language, and Dutch and Indies history. I think it's safe to say that Emiria at least understood a little bit of the Dutch language due to her time here. From this rather privileged upbringing, Emiria would go on to live many lives. First, she trained as a nurse in Chikini Hospital in Jakarta from 1912 to 1914. Chikini Hospital was formerly a mansion owned and designed by famous Indonesian painter Raden Saleh. At the time Emiria was a nurse there, it would have been called Koningin Emma Zeikenhuis or Queen Emma's Hospital. For reasons unknown, Emiria didn't proceed with a career in healthcare. Instead, she traveled to Europe to study music. In 1914-1915, to she was recorded to be studying Dalcro's method Eurythmics in Brussels and Austria. If you haven't heard of Eurythmics before, neither have I. Eurythmics was developed by Swiss musician Emile Jacques Dalcroz, a professor of harmony at the Geneva Conservatory. He wanted to improve his students' musical abilities by increasing their awareness of rhythm. His method was based on rhythmic bodily movements, ear training, and vocal or instrumental improvisation. Eurythmics would go on to influence contemporary ballet and theater. Now, studying Eurythmics against the backdrop of the First World War as a single Indonesian female already puts Emiria Sunasa in a category all her own. It's like the usual rules didn't really apply to her. Music seemed to be a big part of her life. It's unclear when she returned to Indonesia, but in the 1920s, she was working as a singer and pianist in a Dutch social club in Ternate in the Maluku Islands. Then, perhaps wanting to do something else, she began traveling through the Dutch East Indies. 
it said that for the next decade, she worked on plantations, in mines, and in factories. She also lived with ethnic groups in Papua, the Dayak in Kalimantan, and the Kubu in South Sumatra. Here, people who said they knew her described her as an elephant hunter, poison maker, and the tiger woman. Let's pause for a second to think about how fascinating it must have been to meet her at the prime of her life. She would have been in her early 30s at this point. What motivated her to pursue the things she did? How much of these accounts are true and how many are rumors passed down from one generation to another? Would you like to be the kind of person who inspires myths to be written about you? Scholar Heidi Arbuckle suggests that Emeria rarely disputed her history, as she may have benefited from the various personas that other people have constructed of her. In the 1930s, Emeria would take up another profession. She became a pioneer of Indonesian modern art. We're not sure about how Emeria took up painting. Indonesian scholars believe she was self-taught, but Arbuckle thinks, based on several historical sources, that she trained under the Dutch professor Guillaume Frederick Piper, who was her boarder and also possibly her lover. Emeria was very busy. As usual, Emeria couldn't just be a normal hobbyist. If she did something, she took it as far as it could go. So she made her debut as a painter in 1940 at the first art exhibition of native artists held at the Kolf bookstore in Batavia. Her first painting was Telaga Warna, or Color Lake, which is also the title of a popular story in West Java about a king and a queen who couldn't have children. Notably, Amiria Sonasa remained childless despite a number of reported but unconfirmed marriages. I don't know if these things are actually connected, but Arbuckle suggests that the short-lived nature of Amiria's marriages could be attributed to her inability to have children. Knowing that context, it's interesting how she chose this title for her first painting. Sadly, the painting seems to have been lost to circumstances we don't know where it is. The Kolf Bookstore exhibition is very important because this is how she became involved with Persagi, or Persatuan Ahali Gambar Indonesia, in English, the Indonesian Painter Association. Persagi, Chaitanya Sambrani writes, is widely understood to have played a major role in the development of modernism in Indonesian art. While there was no binding style linking the individual artists, they were all in search of a new art that was both distinctively national and intensely individual. It was formed in 1938, a decade after Bahasa Indonesia was declared the national language. Sambrani continues, The artists of Persagi saw themselves as cultural workers within this nascent nation-state, making them part of a broad, socialist-nationalist front aimed at the creation of a new national consciousness out of the inheritance of a colonial past. They also sought divergence from the deeper histories that divided this archipelagic country with its vast geography and a variety of ethnic, religious, and linguistic differences. Emiria was one of only three female artists in Parsagi. The other two were Saptarita Latif and Trijoto Abdullah. However, in contrast to the two other women, Emiria started painting individually. She wasn't linked to any nationalist movements before she became involved with art. Historian Claire Holt writes that Emiria had a solo show at the Union of Art Circles, or Bond van Kunstringen, around 1941. She continued to paint well into the Japanese occupation period that followed. While Emiria was associated with Prasagi, she didn't actually train or work with the group. Dirgantora writes, Persagi's nationalistic vigor came from an unmistakably masculine perspective. Most of the paintings represented common subject matter, self-portraitures, still lifes, and most importantly, the portrayal of the Indonesian people during and after the revolutionary period. And yet, they were limited to the island of Java. Emiria's choice of subject matter offered a different perspective of the new nation. After the break, we'll talk about Emiria's art, what she did after the war, and where you can see her works today. You've heard of the terms colonization or decolonization in bits and pieces. But do you find European colonization too broad and too complicated to get into? Well, there is now a podcast for you. 
Join me, Fidelity, on an introduction through the history of colonization. We will cover not just the major wars and conquests that took place, but also the perspectives of people who have been neglected in the grand Eurocentric narrative of discovery and colonial lens. You can find the History of Colonization podcast on Spotify, iTunes, or wherever you get your podcast from. Lisa Horikawa, in her essay, Reframing Modernism, Emilia Sonasa, writes, In contrast to works by her contemporaries, which tended towards social and mainstream nationalist interests, her works presented the concerns of people at the margins of the nation, ethnic groups on the eastern part of Indonesia, and women. In all of her paintings from the 1940s and 1950s, she focused on those largely unrepresented in the grand national narrative of Indonesia, consistently using subversive approaches to unsettle the assumptions associated with the internal other. When you look at a painting by Amiria, all this becomes clear very quickly. Take, for example, her earliest surviving work, Papuan Archers, shown at the Batavia Konskring as part of the Persagi exhibit. Against a backdrop of the jungle, two archers are depicted with very dark skin, their gleaming white teeth and the white of their eyes standing out in the painting. The jungle appears to be lush and untamed. You can see water lilies behind the archers too. They stare right at you, as if to ask, what are you doing here? Emilia was already in her 40s when she started painting. It's obvious how her unique style just flowed out of her. You can see it in the confidence with which she painted her subjects. Her strokes and color choices were bold, passionate, and above all, raw. She didn't care about rules or techniques or what subjects others were paying attention to. It was like she picked up a brush and let her instincts and memories take care of the rest. The technical term for her style, I've read, is the, quote, primitive style or naive painting, a primitive realization of the self, unquote. I think she was a woman who always knew what she wanted to say, And this was just another way of saying it. It's a myriad world and we're just living in it. Naturally, she was a bit of an enigma to the art community. Persagi founder Sindu Sardono Sujujono seems to have respected her greatly because she was so different. Sujujono writes, Emiria, meskipun seorang perempuan, namun lebih jantan dari Emiria, orang yang lain. even though a woman, is more macho than other people. Her style is primitive, Honest, like a small child, her heartfelt emotion springs like a boil on a virgin's lips. Unbridled, unaccountable, whether we like it or not, appears suddenly in overlooked places. Plenty of people do not understand her art, because Emiria's aesthetic is very peculiar. However, to those who understand, Emiria continues to be sympathetic in her impulsiveness. Because Sujujono associates the primitive and the instinctual with the masculine energy, Emiria is both unusual and unsettling to him, like a boil on a virgin's lips. But he knew talent, and he knew she had it, though it seems like he couldn't quite figure out where it was coming from. And in fact, it was quite unusual at the time for urban, middle-class Indonesians living in Batavia to see the representation of indigenous groups in exhibitions like this, such that they would consider her paintings coming from a strange, other world. Perhaps, to the members of the prestigious art circle and their patrons, Emiria's art was as foreign as her Papuan subjects. We'll just talk about a couple more of Emiria's paintings here. If you're in Singapore or are visiting there soon, you can see some of her paintings at the National Gallery of Singapore's Dalam Southeast Asia exhibit. Dr. Els Tianeke Rieke Katmo is quoted here as saying, The name Emiria Sunasa is new to me. I am astounded to know that there was a great Indonesian woman artist during a time that was difficult for women, the colonial period, when women and nature were objects to yearn after, conquer, and control. The first painting you will see at the National Gallery of Singapore is Orang Irian Dengan Burung Chandrawasi, 
or Irian Man with Birth of Paradise, dated 1946 to 1948. This depicts a dark-skinned man cradling three large birds of paradise in his arms, their feathers painted in streaks of orange, brown, and yellow. Dr. Katmo writes that the man is probably a slave because he's naked and he's meekly presenting the birds to someone, possibly his master. Quote, the enslaved man and the captured bird, unquote. Note that from 1914 to 1926, hunters for birds of paradise began to swarm the areas of South New Guinea. While travelers' accounts of birds of paradise had long fascinated Europeans, newfound access to this area resulted in a burgeoning trade in the European continent. Emiria, during her travels, would have certainly been aware of this trade. Then there's Balakang Kambang Tarate, or danger lurking behind the lotus. Horikawa writes, quote, The taut moment of the archer with his bow drawn is captured in a dreamlike dark jungle studded with electric pink lotus flowers. The ethnic origin of the archer appears to be imaginary, with the Miriam making visual references to several different ethnic groups in the archipelago, unquote. The ethnic origin of the archer appears to be imaginary. I think this is what led some critics like Betty Adi of the Papuan artist collective Odeido to say that Emiria was narrating Papua superficially. She says Emiria's work, done in the spirit of camaraderie, should be appreciated, but, quote, exoticism still constitutes the main reason behind the creation of these works, unquote. Nevertheless, historians are fairly certain that Emiria was the only Indonesian artist of her generation painting Papuan subjects. Before her, images of Papua were largely produced by foreigners as an ethnographic photo or by the colonial military and anthropological expeditions as drawings. Emiria may have had another motivation, though. That is, she claimed to be the rightful monarch of Papua. Could she, in her mind, have been representing her subjects to the greater Indonesian community? If you want a more in-depth discussion of Emiria's work, check out Dr. Wulan Dirgantoro's Feminisms and Contemporary Art in Indonesia. In it, she tackles works like Woman from Sulawesi and Frangipani Flower of Bali, and my personal favorite, Mutiara Bermain, or Pearl at Play. This painting shows two nymphs, naked, underwater. They're standing above an open scallop shell surrounded by anemones and jellyfish. Unlike Venus in Botticelli's Birth of Venus, which it may be referencing, the nymphs are unashamed of their nakedness. They're not covering themselves up or waiting for a robe to be handed to them. In fact, they appear to be dancing, their long black hair swaying in the water. Another fantastic resource is the National Gallery of Singapore's exhibition catalog, Familiar Others, which discusses Emiria, along with Eduardo Masfere and Yechiwe. In 1943, so during the Japanese occupation, the Japanese administration established Keimin Bunkashi Dosho, or Institute for People's Education and Guidance. They named Emiria its secretary. She participated in their exhibition of Indonesian artists and held a solo exhibition in the same year in Pusat Tenagarakyat, or Center of People's Power. In 1946, after the war, she had another solo exhibition in Jakarta. She exhibited 50 paintings representing peoples from throughout Indonesia. It's at this time that Emiria became linked to the Papuan struggle for independence. A very important Papuan activist, Silas Papare, lived with her in Jakarta. He would later co-establish the Partai Kemerdekaan Indonesia Irian, or Indonesian Irian Independence Party. Its goal was Papuan independence from the Dutch as they wanted to become part of Indonesia. In 1949, after a series of wars and treaties, the Dutch colonial government transferred control of the Netherlands East Indies to Indonesia, but excluding Netherlands New Guinea or the Papua region. Emiria, with support from her old friend Silas Papare and the Indonesian Irian Independence Party, submitted her claim as the rightful ruler of Papua to the Roundtable Conference. 
However, this claim was never officially acknowledged. A year later, Emilia held a solo exhibition in Amsterdam, and then in 1952, she joined an exhibition in New York. Her last exhibition was in 1959 in Taman Senirupa Merdeka, Kabayoran, Jakarta, where she participated in a group exhibition with Trisno Sumarjo, Usman Effendi, and Zaini. In 1960, Emilia, now in her mid-60s, traveled to Singapore to seek legal advice on her claim to the Papuan throne. We know this because it was widely reported in newspapers like The Straits Times. She also wrote to The Hague requesting that she be granted an audience with the Prime Minister to discuss both her claim to the throne and her Dutch citizenship. Both requests seem to have been denied. In 1962, Netherlands New Guinea was finally handed over to Indonesia. Then, Emilia left Jakarta one last time. We don't know where she went or why, but it seems like she lived her final years the way she always lived her life, doing exactly what she wanted. Reportedly, she died in Lampung on the southern tip of Sumatra in 1964. Emilia Sunasa Wamana Putri Alalam Makota Tidore, or Emma Wilhelmina Pereira, was 70 years old. She left all her possessions to her neighbor, Jane Wawuruntu. She passed them on to her descendants, who are now the reason many of her works can still be accessed today. Her work has also been offered at auction multiple times. In 2011, her painting Mother and Child sold at a Christie's auction for $6,500. For such an extraordinary life, hardly anybody knows about her today. As Horikawa writes, the complex subjectivity and reception of Emilia as a female artist self-proclaimed princess who struggled for the cause of Papuan independence, who experienced the tumultuous transition from the colonial period to independent Indonesia, has been relegated to near oblivion in modern Indonesian art history. So, share this episode. Visit Dalam Southeast Asia, the National Gallery of Singapore, and show her art to your friends on social media. Maybe we can renew her memory, and, in our small ways, be a part of her many lives. That's it for episode 22, The Many Lives of Emilia Sonasa. If you want to join the Patreon, you can give as little as $1 to get a copy of the show notes with all the references, a shout-out at the end of the next episode, and access to bonus episodes like Nyege de Pinate, the Harbor Master of Gresik, Mayink Tafan and the Chrome Clone, an interview with Haldi Patra on the Minangkabao Matriarchal Society, Queen Suryothai and the War Elephants, Paz Marquez Benitez and Dead Stars, The Rise and Fall of the Achenese Queens, 1641-1699, and The Women of Number 14, Le Boulif. Thank you to our patrons, Akila, Karen, Kero, Shaume by Milish, Jennifer, Christina, Raul, Raymond, Matt, Shireen, Charlie, and Yati. Akila joined the Patreon just last month, so welcome! Don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at HerStoryCPod. That's her story, S-E-A, pod. There are so many more stories to tell, and we're just getting started. This podcast was hosted and edited by Agas Ramirez. Thank you for listening, and we hope to see you again next time. Maraming salamat.